Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all again. Um, my name is Scott Wakeley. I'm the uh, I'm the director of the Enrico Fermi Institute, and um, uh, I'm welcoming you all uh, to this. Let's see if I got my counting right. The 86th uh, Compton Lecture Series. So, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, let's have a little bit of sort of introductory stuff, and then we'll, we'll get to the lecture. Um, need to tell you the, that the lectures are named after Arthur Holly Compton, who I'm sure most of you know was a very distinguished U.S. scientist. Um, he was a Nobel laureate. He was a member of our physics department here for 22 years. And um, during World War II, Compton assembled a really ridiculously amazing team of scientists here at Chicago to work on the war effort. Um, the, 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 the names are people that you've all heard of. It's Teller, it's Urey, it's Anderson, Gephardt Meyer, and of course Fermi. Um, and uh, ultimately, after the war, this core of, of scientists um, became um, the core of two new research institutes, of which the Enrico Fermi Institute is one. At the time, it was called the Institute for uh, Nuclear Studies, a later name for, for, for Fermi. Um, and so the institutes were, were basically built just to the north of us, on a whole city block. And there was, two, there was one large building. There was an, actually an accelerator, a particle accelerator at the time. And, um, you know, the whole idea was let's give these these amazing scientists everything they want so that they don't leave, and it pretty much it, it, it largely worked. Um, now, the idea of these lectures actually started with uh, John Simpson, who was the director in the '70s. He was actually part of the of the Manhattan Project uh, and uh, one of the founding members of the institute. But when he was director, he thought it would be a good idea to. Um, uh, showcase some of the best and the brightest young scientists in the institute and give them a, a venue to uh, describe their very exciting research directly to the public instead of just to you know other dusty scientists and so that's how the the idea was was born um, funding was originally from a man named John W uh, Watset who was a friend of Compton's he, he provided the first bit of, of funding and ever since then uh, the funding has been jointly through the institute and jointly through uh, kind donations of people who, who, who come to the lectures. And um, so in the past, people have brought checks, which is uh, always is always nice, and we welcome that. We've also, if you're feeling, you know, crazy one night uh, on the internet, if you go to efi.uchicago.edu, you'll find a link right at the EFI site where you can donate using a credit card, which is nice, up to $100,000, I'm told. So, you know, go crazy. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, it's, it's really the best and the brightest uh, are selected to give this lecture every year, and among the lecturers are large fraction have gone on to become faculty members at other institutions. Several have gone on to become faculty members here in Chicago. And um, today, um, our lecturer is no exception. Uh, it's Patrick Duke. Oh, I nailed it. It's the umlaut there. Um, and I'd like to say he's a geochemist, but I think that that is probably too narrow of a term for, for the scope of science that he does. Um, he received his PhD from UCLA in 2016, and he won, he won a bunch of awards at UCLA, including the Eugene B. Wagner Scholarship for Outstanding Academic Achievement and Original Research. Um, so he's a, a good example of, of really getting the best, bringing them to, to Chicago and putting them to work. Um, he actually came here as a T.C. Chamberlain Postdoctoral Fellow, which is a very distinguished postdoctoral fellowship here in Chicago. And he, he's now working in the Department of Geophysical Sciences. Um, so uh, the topic of, of his lecture is right here, Hellish or Haiti in the first 500 million years of Earth's existence. So I'm sure you will uh, get a great lecture series. It sounds like a fascinating topic. And also enjoy the room. We have the room remodel. Did you notice? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'll probably see all y'all uh, a couple months from now at, um, at the brunch. 
So we'll send out announcements about when, when that time is locked in. So enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Can you turn the lights up a little bit? No, we didn't turn the lights up. I'll put it up. Oh. I want to get you in the camera as well. Is that better? You can get it down just a tad. That's good, right there. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott, for that, that lovely introduction. Uh, welcome to the lecture series. Thank you for showing up on a Saturday morning. Uh, and the topic that I want to talk about is when I look through the Compton lectures, a very different topic than some of the previous ones. So I'm first going to start off by simply asking you, since this is a topic that a lot of people have taken geoscience classes at some point in their life, this is something that people hear about, there's a lot of sort of documentaries. So I want to simply start out by asking um, you, the audience, before we start this lecture series, what do you think this time period was like when the planet first formed its first, sort of call it the 10% of its existence? Um, anyone have any suggestions? Was it cold, hot, dry, or wet? Hot. Hot? Uh, would you have wanted to live there? No. <laughs> would you have been able to live there? <laughs> that is an excellent question, and that is a topic that we're going to talk, tackle uh, during the seminar se uh, series in probably in a future slide, a future talk towards the end. Besides the earth, I mean, the air at that point would be worse than it was in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, did you, uh, would it have been a time period where you think that there were a lot of impacts uh, raining down on the planet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the things that I'm hearing from the audience are very much so like what the traditional view of the early Earth is like. So there's a Life magazine cover from 1952, uh, meteorites raining down, you have molten rock on the surface of the planet, and then in the year 2000, uh, Peter Ward and Don Brownlee brought out a book, and here's uh, the cover image that they chose. So this is, you know, 48 years later, still the sort of hot, hellish uh, time period where you really wouldn't want to have been on this planet. Uh, through the year 2014, people, uh, certain people have still sort of advocated this view that it really, the picture hasn't changed much, that this is the uh, traditional view of how the Earth behaved during these first 500 million years. This is the, the hellish view and is partly where the time period, the Hadean, which is this first 500 million years that I'm going to talk about really comes from. However, I'm going to start off with the grand claim that this view is largely a myth. That this was based, this was come up with in the absence of evidence. We don't actually have any rocks on this planet from, that are older than 4 billion years. So the time period I'm going to talk about has up until the 80s, that we had no samples on this planet that were old enough that you could go and try and understand what the uh, planet was like. So this view was come up because when the planet formed, it would have been very hot, there would have been a lot of heat, you're smashing things together, we'll get into a little qualitative view of how planets <coughs> formed later today. And then people said, well, it was hot, uh, let's just keep that going until we get a rock record sort of 500 million years or a billion years later. And that really is the origin of the view, and this has uh, despite its popularity, very little, if no, evidence in favor of it, however, has uh, sort of taken, taken hold. So the, the place where we're going to uh, sort of start to go to is try and understand what this old view is and then go into what I think is a more accurate representation of this time period, which is that we have evidence at the time for liquid water. Uh, we know certain things about the atmosphere, and that uh, there was potentially life back then. So, yes? Well, do you take into consideration in your study that, that the Earth, four and a half billion years ago, the radioactive elements would have been a lot younger and hotter? Yes, and these are, these are all things that we're going to get into, that there was more radioactive decay uh, that could have made it hotter, but you're able to essentially burn off a lot of heat off a planet if you so choose. So how much heat you lose is also an important thing for the temperature. So we'll get into that. The early atmosphere has to do with that. Yes? I wonder how there could be much water since there probably wasn't 
and the oxygen. Uh, oxygen is in the free oxygen you're sort of breathing around right now. It's a very chemically reactive thing. It's incredibly unstable. Oxygen in other settings is one of the most abundant elements in the universe and certainly one of the most abundant things. Any rock is basically silicon and oxygen so, and some iron. So you have a lot of oxygen around. Anyway, it's just locked up in other forms so you can't breathe it. So actually if you look at the handout, which I was going to talk about a little bit at the end, these are uh, stellar abundances and then the abundances in the crust of various elements normalized to silicon. And so you can see that there is a lot of oxygen. So the question about water is in part, we'll get into this later, is how did it get here? How do we have water on the surface? But a lack of actual oxygen is not necessarily a problem here. You can have a lot of water even in the absence of uh, free molecular oxygen. So I guess the, the, sort of the way to put this lecture series in context is we're going to try and use really fancy technology to come up with a better uh, story of how the planet formed and to try and get some understanding and an evidence-based view so that we can replace this the <coughs> sort of myth view with something that is really evidence-based. And this is an instrument that is actually uh, in the Department of Geophysical Sciences here. It is a completely unique uh, instrument that we're going to talk about and see some results from. But this is a picture that I took. Uh, yesterday while working on it. So this is the instrument that I use. It's the Chicago Instrument for Laser Ionization, otherwise known as CHILI. And it is a really, really cool mass spectrometer that we're going to talk about in a couple of lectures. But just to give you a teaser that there will be fancy technology in this. So uh, the, the views even published today in the literature really still sort of represent this sort of dualistic view of the early Earth. You can read some papers that advocate for a really hot uh, planet early on, and other ones that advocate for a really cool planet. And we're really going to try and understand this dichotomy, what we know, what we don't know, and worse, what we think we know, but really don't know. So I'm going to try and sort of break everything into those contexts for you, because this problem is a lot harder than it first seems, right? We live on this planet, we've been doing geology for a really long time, but our ability to access records that old is uh, really only been possible as of maybe the last 20 or so years, 30 years, because of advances in technology, because the geologic record for this time period that I'm going to talk about, just to give you a teaser, is a mineral called zircon, which is less than half a millimeter across, usually. So this is incredibly small. This is a couple of times the diameter of your hair. Uh, so this is really hard to get information from. So the, the title for the lecture series is that this, uh, uh, the original view, you have the sort of the, the hellish view, right? The, the biblical notion of hell where you've got fire, molten rock, brimstone. And then the ancient Greek view where you had the river Styx and looked a lot colder. So actually, although the name Hadean came about when we thought this was a really hot, cold, uh, sorry, a hot, dry, hellish place to be. I'm going to argue the name Hedean is actually quite appropriate because the uh, Greek version of hell has a lot more uh, cooler parts to it with um, even liquid water. So that, if you were curious about the title, that's uh, what I was going for. So why, in a sense, should we, uh, should we care about this topic? I mean, I think it's interesting to know how we got to be here, but the other one is that how planets evolve and develop and whether or not they're habitable is now one of the questions in related to we're finding exoplanets. We're finding planets around other suns. We're finding things that are uh, look might be looking. You hear about super-Earths. You hear about maybe uh, Earth-like planets. And the question of habitability comes up. And I think this is, the, this is the planet we have the best understanding of. And it's woefully incomplete, especially in its early period. But if you get a, this is Venus, super put next to the Earth, they're about the same size, but one of them is quite hellish, and the other one is quite nice today. So uh, when you find things like exoplanets and get the size, the understanding that we need for planets is still at a much deeper level. Simply finding something that is Earth-like and even has maybe you know close to an Earth uh, planetary orbit which might not be habitable because it could have evolved completely differently. So planets are these fascinatingly complex things, and we're going to try and use, use the Earth to understand 
what makes the Earth habitable? When did we get uh, the first sort of habitability in this development? But, so in that theme, I just as a, the topics that we're going to cover, uh, the things that are important for habitability, we're ultimately going to try and basically address the question of when did the Earth first become habitable? And what did we need for that? So for habitability, we need things like we need to be in the habitable zone. So you don't really want to be too far or too close to your host star because otherwise it's way too hot. And if it's way too hot, then you've got other problems. If you're too far out, it's too cold. And so you, get, uh, you end up with uh, not having any sort of interesting chemistry take place. You sort of have ice. So the Earth, this is not a problem. We're definitely in the habitable zone. Surface water is really important. Uh, as far as we know, people think you know, the origin of life happened with black smokers. We, water is certainly one of the integral uh, components of our, uh, of our daily life. Uh, we need it to live off of a lot. Basically, all life needs it to live off. Interior water in the planet itself is really important because it changes how rocks behave. A completely dry rock is really hard to bend. So in plate tectonics, you've got to bend plates that are subducting down. So on this planet right now are uh, subduction zones, so plates, so the surface is getting put down into the mantle. The mantle itself is solid but convecting. And this basically gets a lot easier. Uh, you don't have to worry about the details, but basically here is the, the strain rate or sort of how hard it is to bend the rock. And when it's dry, it's a lot lower than when it's wet. So basically adding even a little bit of water to the interior of your planet allows things like the mantle to convect, it is critically important for plate tectonics. It changes when rocks melt, so it changes the volcanism on the surface of the planet. The composition, you need things uh, in your planet. You would need some sort of carbon. Since all life that we know of is carbon-based, you're going to want some sort of carbon. You're going to want some sort of water. So you need all of these things uh, to potentially be habitable. You want your planet to be large enough to retain an atmosphere, right? If your mercury is really small, you're going to have a lot of atmospheric escape. Even on Earth, uh, hydrogen escapes to space. So if you're uh, too small, you don't retain an atmosphere. If you're too large, you end up turning into something like Jupiter, where you've got a, uh, you don't really have a surface anymore. You've got a layer between the gas and, and the liquid. You've got way too much of an atmosphere, so you want a size that's just about right. Uh, impacts are both good and bad in this scenario. In some sense, the impacts killed off the dinosaurs, so that's bad for habitability, but they can also create niches for life. Uh, so this is a, a computer model of the Earth where impacts run in, and basically the question is how much do you heat the surface up, and what you find for uh, is that you can actually get the surface to be quite form for things like extremophiles, so thermophiles, so bacteria that likes heat, so you can create uh, zones that are better and worse uh, for certain habitability. Impactors themselves uh, can deliver a lot of material to your surface. Uh, we have things like uh, you can deliver water that way from comets. Carbonaceous chondrites are a type of meteorite that have a uh, a lot of carbon in them, so you might be bringing vitally important uh, elements to the planet that you need. Satellites, uh, a moon is really helpful for things like tide and tidal interactions, so you're going to end up uh, you're going to end up changing the surface behavior. They also protect the surface a little bit by catching some of the stray impactors, so you reduce the impact flux a little bit. Uh, heating. Uh, you want enough heat so that your planet isn't uh, dead. So this is uh, heat production from radioactive decay, which is about, uh, we think, currently maybe half of the heat production, the other half just being cooling, core uh, crystallizing, and uh, other uh, factors. So this is the radioactive decay. It was much hotter. So four plus billion years ago, there was a lot more, especially uranium-235 around, there was a lot more heat production back then, and it's uh, cut down dramatically. So this uh, early on would have definitely changed the dynamic behavior of your planet. Whether or not plate tectonics could have operated, can you have a subduction zone when you have this much heat production and the entire planet is warmer? But if you have no heat production and the planet is cold, then you have no more ability to really uh, recycle the surface. So here is a, uh, there is a subduction zone. This is 
really not at all to scale. But the beautiful part about this is that through plate tectonics, we're continuously creating a fresh surface on the planet. So we're continuously allowing fresh rocks to interact with the atmosphere, and we're subducting other materials back down. So here, uh, what is drawn is basic is uh, an attempt at a feedback system of the, the carbon cycle. So you've got carbon coming out from volcanic eruptions. It can uh, go into photosynthesis and uh, be transformed into different materials. But if you were to shut this off, you would have no more release of the CO2 into the atmosphere from volcanoes. You'd have no more uh, fresh rock to interact. So that would certainly change the expression of your planet. And finally, the final sort of ingredient that we're going to we're going to come back and talk about all of these topics repeatedly throughout this course because when these things first appeared on Earth and what we can say about them is really one of the key things to, what, to how that time period uh, was like. The geodynamo, the Earth has a magnetic field. This is great. It protects us from a lot of particle irradiation. So the sun is uh, throwing off. There's a solar wind that is a wind of charged particles that's being deflected. It helps reduce uh, cosmic So this is uh, another uh, important question is when did the Earth first get a magnetic field? Because this helps you also keep an atmosphere because otherwise the solar wind would be a lot more efficient in stripping it off. And this also helps protect us from radiation. So these are some of the topics that question. I've... Mm -hmm. You told us that interior water was necessary for the plate tectonics. Yep. Have I missed any connection whatsoever between that and habitability? Uh, the plate tectonics is a key thing for uh, bringing fresh rock and fresh material back onto the surface and changing some of the forms of that. So we'll get, we'll get into that. And that's important for habitability? Yes, because that allows things like uh, there is a, there's a feedback system between CO2 can interact with rocks. And this on long-term timescales is called silicate weathering. Uh, it's a sort of a thermostat where you can, if you have a lot of CO2, you can draw that down by having it interact with the rock. So this is this connection becomes uh, really important. So we'll we'll get there. Um, during, uh, so this is this is just to give a sort of flavor and to sort of give away where this course or where this lecture series is headed. Uh, so if this all sounds really complicated uh, and you're sort of lost, that's because it is. That's the simplified version. <laughs> And uh, it is at least easier than running the Afghan. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the slide that uh, it appeared in the New York Times and got the Pentagon in trouble for the basic claim being that they have no idea what they're doing because look at what a mess this slide is. <laughs> so uh, at least we don't have to understand that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to stick with this. So these are some of the things that I talked about. The position with respect to the star has an influence on whether or not you have liquid water, so it impacts. This has an impact on the biochemistry. Uh, the composition the, um, the position has some effect on the composition. If you're too far out, you're likely to become a gas giant. If, you're too, um, if you are the wrong mass, then you're not likely to be habitable because you won't retain an impact. Uh, you won't retain an atmosphere. Impacts are, of course, one of the great ways that we can add mass to the planet, and the accretion likely, the formation of the planet likely happened during a series of impacts. Uh, satellites have things to do with a stable planetary surface, so if you have tidal interactions and things like that, uh, an atmosphere is affected by all of these factors, and ultimately, this sort of leads you into uh, the, habitability, the question of habitability and can you have life. So now, uh, having sort of given away where we're going and what the interactions are that we're going to look at, I want to back up a bit because I didn't want to start the lecture series off by dropping a planet here and saying it was here and let's, uh, let's talk about it. So instead, uh, I just want to sort of briefly for the rest of today go over the first sort of 9 billion years of the universe's history, and then we'll spend the rest of the time on the 500 million years uh, after the planet formed. So that way you get, yes? I just want to ask a quick one. We know the planets changed in orbits over the formation of the planet. Do we think Earth is basically in the same orbit? They are, 4 billion years ago as we are today? They're, we'll get into orbit questions and things like that a little later. The long and the short of it is that we have no really good evidence for a lot of uh, movement. So there are ideas that planets could have rearranged in their orbits. We'll get into this towards the end because it's really 
uh, affecting some of the impact things that are happening. But uh, hold that thought. Uh, so the universe it sort of formed in the Big Bang. Then we had a whole bunch of time when it was really, really uh, hot and it was cooling. And then about 400 million years after that, you got the first stars and you started making galaxies, planets, and things. And then about, you know, uh, somewhere around here, probably on this diagram, we made the solar system. So the first thing I want to talk about briefly, and just to give just to give an overview and the impression that I want you to take away from the next couple of slides on nuclear synthesis, which is how do stars make elements, is that there's a lot of different processes that make some of the elements. Different stars make them, and so that there is a lot of variability that when you form a solar system that you end up having as a result of there being multiple processes taking place in multiple stellar objects, and that some of these differences are great tracers of where did the material that made the Earth come from. So if we look at a meteorite, we can use some of these uh, isotopic differences to say, where did this come from? Is it more like meteor class, meteorite class A? Is it like an ordinary uh, chondrite, which is a sort of the stony meteorite? Is it more like a carbonaceous chondrite, which has uh, a high carbon content? So the, uh, the process in which you can make elements, it depends on the element when you're doing it. During the Big Bang, you had some nuclear synthesis that basically made you up to about lithium-7. You can't, in the Big Bang, really get any, high, any higher in mass than this because you'll notice that there is a notable absence here at mass 5. There is no element of mass 5, so you can't basically take a helium and a hydrogen together. What you end up making has a half-life of 10 to the minus 24 seconds, so it basically doesn't exist. And I'm a little surprised that we actually know that number. <laughs> mass 8 has a very similar problem. You're also talking about a half-life of 10 to the minus 20 seconds. And this is really what prevents you from going uh, further, is that you just don't have enough time to try often enough to make the heavier uh, elements. Because what you need for that is, uh, in order to then, you can then make a 12 carbon is the next one. This takes a while. This is what happens in stars is you need three alphas. You need three helium particles to be together in the same place within that 10 to the minus 20 seconds, and then you make a carbon 12. If you only put two of them together, it immediately falls apart again. So this is a process that's going to take a really long time. So it's going to take uh, stars to make us things. And in stars like our sun, we make elements, you know, uh, helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And then in massive stars, you can make things up to iron 56 through fusion, and this is really then when uh, fusion runs out. So after this, adding more in a fusion reaction doesn't give you net energy, so they tend not to happen. But you can then have neutron captures because in, in stars where you have a lot of neutrons floating around, an element, you might interact with an atom, it might grab the neutron, and now you've made one heavier. So let's, uh, so here is one version of the abundance of the elements in stars. You can see a couple of features. Lithium, beryllium, and boron are really unabundant. This is because beryllium and boron are really, really hard to make through nuclear synthesis. They're produced actually by cosmic ray interactions. They're actually produced by things like oxygen uh, being hit at high energies and falling apart. Because these are, it's so hard to get for beryllium to get to beryllium to mass. Uh, 10 for boron, it's also really hard to get to masses 10 and 11 based upon the constituents that we have. So those rates are really low. Then uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, these reactants are much more favorable. You then in supernovae make uh, the iron peak. So this iron 56 is about as high as fusion goes. And all of these elements out past it are made in neutron capture reactions that I'm going to talk about in a second in things called the S and the R uh, process. So there are three, there are, as I was, there are three basic types of these neutron capture products. You make all of these heavier elements than iron. There is the S process. This is a slow process. So this is you see a neutron, and you see it. You might see another neutron if you're an atom floating around in the setting. You might see it a month later, or a year later. So we're talking about really long time scale. So if you make something in between that is unstable, that can radioactively decay, it will radioactively decay. Uh, in between. So this uh, primarily makes uh, uh, stable isotopes, so things that don't radioactively decay, that can be reached uh, so from, it makes things from a stable isotope. So if you 
if you're floating around, you need to be stable long enough on this time scale of months or years that something can interact with you. The R, the R process is the rapid neutron capture. And this is when you have immensely high uh, neutron fluxes. So this is when you have orders of magnitude higher. It's not like the S process, you see a neutron every month. This is you see a neutron, uh, you see them in, you know, it's, you have to wait le much less than a second to see another neutron. Uh, so this is, uh, we think, happens during supernovae, during very exciting stellar environments. And it adds neutrons rapidly so that you are making something really unstable and all of this stuff has got to decay. So you can get to really interesting parts of the chart of neutrons. You can make really interesting isotopes and I'll have an example of this uh, in a second. So you initially, you add so many neutrons to something that's really unstable and then it's got to radioactively decay back uh, to stability. The P process probably also occurs during supernovae and this is if you uh, this makes certain isotopes where uh, you're doing this by either adding a proton, so by catching one, or by knocking a neutron off the, the target atom. So this, this makes things that are to the left of what is called the S process path, which I'll show you an example of. This is, there's a path that the S process sort of makes, and, I'm gonna, uh, and this makes things to the left, and uh, the R process basically makes things to the right. So, to give this in a sort of uh, schematic view, you, in the S process, you start at a stable isotope, you add a neutron, and then if you're stable, great, you're probably going to add another neutron, and you kind of make your way up the chain until bismuth 209. And if you're not, then you're going to radioactively decay, usually uh, via beta decay, uh, to a sta until you hit a stable isotope, and then you can add more neutrons. So this is how we can make basically everything up to 209 business. So we can't make uranium to this, so we know we need another stellar process for that because we have uranium on the planet today. And this is because polonium 210 and alpha decays back to lead 206. So if you add a neutron to bismuth 209 in the S process, you end up at mass 206 via uh, radioactive decay where you make an alpha particle or a helium. Uh, in the R process, you have a huge neutron flux. So you have from your stable isotopes, from your starting material, you add a ton of neutrons. You're not going to end up at a stable isotope, so I've taken the yes path off. So you're going to go, no, you're going to decay. Usually you're going to have a lot of radioactive decays before you end up back at stability. And the thought is here that this is something that might happen once, that the flux happens, and then you sort of radioactively decay back after, and is not sort of a, as a continuing uh, process. So the... Uh, the, this is a chart, so this is neutron number here versus the atomic number Z, so this tells you uh, this tells you what the element is that we're looking at, so each horizontal row here is an element, and each of the vertical separations here, probably easiest to see up here, each of these little dots are a different isotope, so the same element but a different mass, and the, the S process basically takes you up in this sort of zigzag path. We'll zoom in on this in a second. So the S process takes you along. Oh, this is unstable, so you come back. So you, then you can hit, take another neutron and go over. And so this is how you kind of make your way up to uh, bismuth 209. And the R process takes you all the way. Look at, look at how far out we are from the, from the valley, from the stability, from where the stable nu nuclei are. And then it pushes us all the way up here, and then we've got a, a decay back here. And so we can also uh, go and produce, so this is how we produce things like uranium, is by the R process. So you take some of these uh, heavy uh, elements, add a lot of neutrons, and then they'll decay back up, and they'll make things like uranium, plutonium, and other uh, sort of actinides that are, that are, in, that are in there out past 209 bismuth. So a zoomed in version of this, if we start from 56 iron and just add some neutrons, we'll make, you know, 57, 58, iron 59 is unstable, so we decay to cobalt, uh, cobalt 60 is unstable, so we decay to nickel 60, and then we can go across. In some cases here you have what are known as branching points, where the half-life is sort of intermediate, where you might decay and go and go up, or you might see another neutron and go over, so we can create some diversity that now depends specifically on what the uh, neutron density is and how much, uh, 
is going on, how much branching you have. So you can kind of make your way up. But you can see we've already left out some of the lighter uh, elements. These are the p-process elements. So this is where you either add a proton or you knock some neutrons off and to end up over here. So these are generally pretty rare. And then for the r-process nuclides out here, you can see if you come with the s-process here in zinc, you end up not being able to bridge this gap because the half-life is so short. So to get there, you need to go with the r-process. So this, the isotopic ratios then, so if you look at how much of each isotope is in a terrestrial sample, is it a meteorite, tells you something about the stellar environments that made these. And this lets you do uh, fantastic sort of astrophysics work where you can use this to understand stellar environments. But I really want to end up using a lot of these differences to understand uh, where the materials are coming from that make up our planet and what that tells us about element delivery and where those elements come from. So we're going to use these differences to really uh, talk about where material comes from. So this is going to be a really useful tool for us. And measuring isotopic ratios is one of the mainstays of geochemistry, of cosmochemistry, because isotope, different isotopes behave chemically similar, or chemically identically, uh, for this purpose, but they have some uh, mass differences, and we can exploit those to understand processes in the, in a sense, independent of the chemistry differences uh, between elements. So elements will behave totally differently. Isotopes are pretty similar, so we can use uh, that to our advantage to try and understand things like maybe where water comes from or uh, other such uh, processes. So here, just a sort of a quick uh, summary. So the Big Bang, you basically make up to seven. You can't make five and eight because of how ridiculously short those half-lives are. Uh, stellar fusion, you can basically make helium up through iron, and then it's these neutron capture processes that make everything else. So here you go to bismuth, and sort of the, some of the isotopes, R processes are going to make these really heavy isotopes of each element, and the P process is what makes the light isotopes of some of these elements that are to the left of that path. So the other, uh, int the other topic that I want to get out of the way is that now that we have some material, we've discussed the stellar environment, let's talk about how for the let's talk about how we make a solar system. And then starting with the next lecture next Saturday, we're going to talk start talking about uh, the early Earth and what uh, we know and things like that. So we have quite a bit of data that we need to explain. Uh, in order to understand sort of solar system for formation. So first off, planets are things that are isolated. They have circular orbits sort of in the same plane. This is uh, one of the reasons why basically Pluto had to be demoted. It's not a planet anymore. Uh, so you have the planets, they have wildly different orbits. They come way out to Uranus where you've got you know, a 30,000 year orbit or Neptune in a 60, sorry, a 60,000 day orbit. Uh, Venus has got a, is getting closer, it's got a shorter orbit. The Earth here, of course, is uh, 365. In between, uh, out past Mars, you have the asteroid belt. This is material that there wasn't enough mass there to form a planet, so it stays in a much earlier stage of planetary formation. So asteroids are really useful objects, and this is basically where the main uh, population of meteorites that we get on the Earth comes from. Uh, so. This is, going to, this is basically storing some of that material from Earth's formation, and, or from planetary formation. So they, they go in the same orbit, and when viewed above, they go counterclockwise. Uh, they are basically two types. We can have the rocky planets. These are the inner ones, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And these are rocky, dense, density of four to five grams, basically sort of rock-like densities. And then you've got the gas giants, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And these are the sort of light, gassy. These are covered in hydrogen and helium. They have a much lower bulk density. So any viable view of planetary formation must explain why we have the gas giants, why we have uh, the rocky planets. So how did this all start out? Well, originally, we started from a really low-density 
cold, thinly dispersed cloud of gas and dust. This is the molecular cloud. This is what was there prior to uh, the formation. So this sort of sits around. It's collected material from many generations of stars. Many different stars have put material into this, so you get this sort of huge mess. Uh, here's an image of one of these regions taken by Hubble. That, of course, is an artist's rendition. Can you find the dust exactly? We're talking about helium and hydrogen plus helium, hydrogen. We have silicate particles. I mean, things like silicon carbide will be in there. Corundum. We've got a huge variety of things that would be dust. And we need heavy elements left over from supernovae and that sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. Uh, everything that we need in the solar system was in that molecular cloud to begin with. So all of the sort of the heavy elements that we got were there either in a gas or condensed onto little grains. And so we still find evidence for some of some of these uh, grains today in meteorites. They are called presolar grains. So we actually find them preserved. And the group, the instrument that I showed you, the uh, Chile, uh, its main purpose actually is to analyze those grains and try to understand the stellar environment that formed a sink, one of these uh, grains. My and understanding was that the cloud of dust was the gas, and dust was there, and then it was seeded about five billion years ago by at least one supernova in the region, or maybe two. Uh, if there was a supernova, so something triggered the collapse. Right. That what that process is is unknown. There are ideas that it was a supernova, but we have no evidence that actually requires it to be a supernova. So this is, uh, it's a little too far out, so I didn't want to include too much on it, but uh, the basic, one of the popular models has been that you can have a supernova go off and this triggers the collapse. And the issue with that model is actually, we've done a lot of work next door on this, is that you would predict certain radioactive elements to be in the early solar system especially one called iron-60. So this is a, an R process iron uh, isotope. It's got a half-life of about 2.5 million years. And supernovas are a great way to make this stuff. So if you have one that is basically seeding it, triggering the collapse within uh, the relevant time scales, you would expect to find a lot of iron-60. And this has been controversial. People have found it. And then they say, look, we now have evidence for our supernova. And then other people say, no, 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 you messed up your measurements. We didn't find it. So the latest iteration on this debate is that uh, using Chile, we've uh, checked some of the samples where people have claimed to have found iron 60, and we don't find any. So uh, that whether or not there was a supernova, or maybe just winds of something, or some other trigger, is still an open topic for debate. There are a lot of different models. Supernovas certainly are, are one of them, but it was too far afield that I didn't want to put slides in on specifically what triggered it. So we're here today. Something triggered the molecular cloud to collapse. Uh, people are still actively working out what that is. So you start as you get more and more material. This is going to try and collapse. Uh, so there's an artist's rendition. So sort of you've got the protostar. You're going to try and the gravity. Uh, gravity is going to try and concentrate stuff in the middle. It's going to get hot. It's going to get really hot in the middle. We'll talk about temperatures, but you're thinking like 2,000 Kelvin or something are good temperatures for the middle. So really, really hot and much colder on the outside. Um, this is uh, rotating at the, or the directions that the planets are in today is still this original uh, rotation. So it got, it got a rotating star. It collapsed into a disk. Uh, the, in the middle, it becomes uh, hotter and denser, and this then becomes the proto the proto sun. You have the disk around it in the uh, in the phases. This is what you're going to form your planets out of, and still an artist's rendition. But now uh, metallic elements and such are going to condense. And here we actually this is a picture of TW hydrate taken by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This is a, an array of radio telescopes in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and is one of the most stunning images I've seen. So this is sort of 180. So this is sort of something around the size of our solar system, and you can see the middle middle part is really dense and hot, and you can see these gaps appearing here. These are planets forming and clearing out their neighborhoods. So now instead of having to show you an artist rendition, we can actually go and take pictures of this process happening uh, in our galaxy. So in the outside, it's colder. So you're going to have things like hydrogen, uh, methane, water, 
nitrogen ice that's going to condense. And in the middle, this is where you're going to try, this is where it's going to be really hot, where you're going to form your uh, rocky planet. So in the inner part, you're getting uh, silicate minerals, uh, all of you are getting metal, you're going to form these hot planets that are themselves going to differentiate. On the outside here, you've got uh, the lighter stuff. So now light elements, ice is not stable here, liquid water isn't stable here, so this is uh, hot, dry silicate. As these little particles form through sort of millimeter sizes, they're going to start to stick together. A centimeter size, so you're basically going to build stuff up serially by accreting stuff together and having it get bigger and bigger by having it stick together, but impacts can also break stuff up. So this is a process that's going to take some time. And you can sort of form planetesimals up to a few kilometers across. And we know from uh, radiometric uh, dating, which I'll discuss, that this happened really quickly from when the solar system started forming. So you're thinking within a couple of million years. Solar system is four and a half billion years, so this is less than a percent of the uh, age of solar system that this process took. Uh, here is that same image from the TW hydrate from the, uh, the Atacama large millimeter array ALMA. And this inner part, this image is about an AU. So this is showing you that you can now actually see one AU is the Earth's, is the Earth's orbit from the sun. So you can actually see... Uh, in these disks, in these images, they're now high quality enough that you can see planets such as a, an Earth, maybe an Earth-like object forming uh, out of the gas and dust. And then, of course, the outer parts are other planets that are further out. So this is really, uh, we're at the stage now with radio telescopes that we can see uh, planets, even planets such as the Earth, at least the evidence of their formation, because you're clearing out uh, that area. So the protoplanets are going to sweep up material, they're going to chew up that material, they're really going to clear out their local orbits, but out here where it's cold enough, the gas giants form, you're basically clearing out because there's still the helium and the hydrogen and the gas is still around, so you're going to try and sort of sweep that up. And then you can, as you can get uh, further out, so here in the outer solar system, as I just said, you're um, you're going, to try, you're going to have some sort of a core for planets like Jupiter. We think that they may have had about an Earth-sized sort of initial rocky core, and then basically gas has started sticking to them. This is still, the interior structures of these uh, outer planets is still not sufficiently well known. To Jupiter, there's currently the Juno mission that's going to try and answer this question, because we can't go there and go and take a sample. It's beyond our technical capabilities, so there's a lot of... Uh, modeling that goes on uh, to try and explain this, but the basic idea is that this might have started, that Jupiter might have started as a rocky planet and then sort of swept up the gases and other materials that were still stable because it wasn't quite as hot out there. Uh, when you go even further out there, you have objects like, uh, this is Pluto from New Horizons, uh, which flew by there and uh, took, took a picture. So here you have sort of ice and you don't, you may not have the gas densities necessary or uh, and the particle density to make really big objects, so you tend to make smaller things, such as uh, Pluto. And then we'll finish off just with the sort of the a brief overview of how the, what happens to the planets when they form. So the the process that makes them the accretion. These are things. These are uh, by the time you're making planetary things, these are hundreds or thousands of kilometer-sized bodies slamming into each other. These are hot processes, so the planets would have started out molten, and then uh, you melt the material, and the iron is going to sink to the middle. So if you look uh, here, this is the sort of, there's an iron, uh, we'll use the earth, so there's an iron core because when the planet was forming and melted, there was a process that let the, the dense material, the iron sank to the middle, the outer part was silicate, still has a lot of iron, magnesium, silicon, and oxygen. And those are the main elements in the mantle, and then on top of it, we get a crust. The moon uh, almost certainly has a core, and so you can see Mars has got a core, it's got a mantle, it's got a crust. So this structure is pretty uh, uniform across planets that they form hot, they form molten, and then the heavy part uh, sinks to the middle. So, uh, as we're just about out of time, perfect. Uh, we'll finish up with how we know the age, and so we've got, so how do we know that this was 4.6 billion years? Well, the moon has got rocks and other samples on it that go back to 
basically 4.4, 4.5. So we're not quite there. Uh, meteorites, however, get back to the age of the solar system, and in particular, one kind of uh, sample within them called a calcium aluminum inclusion that we'll get to. And the Earth, as I mentioned, uh, this lecture series is quite difficult because the oldest rock is right around 4 billion years. So the oldest rock is too young for this lecture series. And a mineral called zircon, which is zirconium, silicon, and oxygen, it goes back to right about 4.4 billion years. So that even leaves the first 100 million years of the planet completely uncovered by any geologic record. We just have sort of 4.4 billion years of younger materials. And we know this by looking at, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about this, the decay of uranium to lead. So we can actually go out and accurately assign the, the ages. So just as a, to finish up, how do we know the age of the solar system? This is a picture of Allende. This is a meteorite that fell in Mexico and is really uh, one of the things that got cosmochemistry as a field uh, started. And inside, uh, you have this material. It's called the CAI, calcium aluminum inclusion. It formed between 1800 and 2000 Kelvin by condensing from a hot Gas. Gas. Then you have chondrules that form at lower temperatures in a matrix. But the thing that I really want to talk about is these really hot things. Because if you take, if you were to take a gas of broadly solar system composition and let it condense from 2,000 uh, Kelvin down, the first thing that you would predict is uh, that you form a mineral called corundum and then you make hibonite. These are aluminum and calcium bearing uh, minerals. So these calcium aluminum fluids are the first objects that condense out of this really hot cloud during the gas cloud during the collapse and were lucky enough to have survived this process. And then as you get to lower temperatures, you make a whole bunch of other minerals. But it means that if you go to a meteorite and you find these calcium aluminum inclusions, you're getting really the first part of this condensation sequence. You're getting the first part of the solar system formation. So if you can get an age for those based upon uranium and lead system, uh, which is exactly uh, what was done, although for a different meteorite than Allende, you find that the age is four, five, six, seven bil uh, million years. So 4.567 plus or minus about 600,000 years. So we can get this to really high precision with modern me measurements based upon how much uranium and how much lead uh, produced by the decay of uranium is in these uh, inclusions, and we know that these are some of the first things that form, so this is the age of the solar system. So there's just some sort of references for materials that are used, and in total, that's it. So thank you very much.